Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Manilka Sumanatilaka, Vice President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to warmly welcome all the participants for this uh, webinar in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of uh, Oncologists. I'm very thankful for the uh, College of Oncologists for collaborating with us on this important topic of cancer care during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We have an eminent panel of speakers to speak on different topics of uh, uh, cancer care during this COVID pandemic. To proceed with the, uh, uh, the webinar today, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Buddhika Somavadana, consultant hemato-oncologist at the National uh, Cancer Hospital, Maharagama. Uh, over to you, Buddhika, to uh, carry on the proceedings. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sumanathilaka, for that kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon to you all. Um, and uh, this is a very uh, important and a very timely topic that we are going to have uh, on this webinar today. So I welcome you all again uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Oncologists and the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this joint webinar. Uh, so we are going to talk about uh, this uh, today on uh, COVID uh, uh, cancer care during COVID-19 pandemic. So this uh, short uh, webinar consists of three uh, lectures. Uh, without further ado, uh, I uh, introduce the first speaker. Uh, so we have with us Dr. Uh, Nadaraja Jayakumaran, uh, who is a consultant clinical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute of Sri Lanka. And he is the consultant uh, coordinating and leading the COVID action committee of the institute so he has been involved in a lot of decision making pertaining to uh, uh, management of patients uh, with cancers who have contracted covid during this uh, pandemic and he is the president elect of the sri lanka college of oncologists so over to you dr jayakumar to start with uh, about uh, uh, the the challenges and experiences faced in oncology care uh, providing oncology care during this pandemic. Thank you, Buddhika. Uh, I will let me share the presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you all see my slides? Okay. My topic is challenges of cancer care in Sri Lanka during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, first, I would like to start this small introduction to COVID in Sri Lanka. Uh, you all know that, uh, that on the 27th of January 2020, uh, first uh, foreign, uh, that is a Chinese lady had a COVID-19 and got admitted to IDH. And on 11th of March 2020, 52 years old, um, uh, one gentleman to a guide from Sri Lankan had the COVID-19. With that only, our uh, COVID situation uh, started to worse uh, at this moment. So then to control this COVID-19 pandemic, government has enforced uh, strict strategies of case detection, identification of con contacts, quarantine procedures, travel restrictions, nationwide curfews on and on they declared, isolation of some villages, closure of airport, and spraying disinfectant and other control measures uh, like uh, closure of universities, schools, and preschools, prohibition of mass gathering, and the banning of uh, festivals, religious activities, sports activities, closure of social or leisure activities like nightclubs and other activities, and also to their banned visiting cinema, zoo, and botanical gardens, museum, and declared on and off some public holidays. Also, they introduced uh, work from home, and home delivery of essential items, medications, all have been done. 
Uh, this is a little bit uh, in the beginning. If you see this um, uh, two uh, Sri Lankan uh, pictures are there. One is the COVID situation in the early uh, days, plus on the other side, right hand side, there is the where our uh, cancer units are there. So we have nine provinces, and each provinces there is a center of excellence. So and the uh, atom blinking parts are the one uh, centers having the. Uh, radiotherapy facility, others in the district facilities also marked here. So if you see at the beginning, the Colombo National Cancer Institute uh, and Ragama Hospital, uh, as well as uh, Kalapura Hospitals, which had the cancer patients, have suffered a lot because uh, they had a lot of problems those days. And so uh, currently, yesterday's statistics, uh, even though that March 11th, we start the first case of Sri Lankan case, now we are with uh, 264,967 cases and active cases are 58,209. So this is the current situation uh, and the deaths per day are 40 odd. So now I'll go on to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic of cancer care services in Sri Lanka, how it has impacted. So actually as an oncologist, uh, each oncologist has to involve in prevention, early diagnosis, early detection, diagnosis and treatment, and some palliative care or quality life care or support care. So at the moment during this COVID situation or COVID crisis time, we usually concentrate more on diagnosing bad cancers and treating them to live longer and also to comfort them with palliative settings. So cancer and COVID infection, some facts you have to know that there is cancer treatment can weaken the immune system. That is obvious, everybody knows. It's a common fact. And high risk of COVID complications uh, are occurring, especially after the treatment, especially after high dose uh, chemotherapy. And the risk level goes to 10 to 20 fold. Chemotherapy also affects the immune system. Still, cancer patients need treatment to live long or disease management point of view, and they have to visit the clinic and hospitals, cancer hospitals. So how can we care them in different manner or differently? That's the thing I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes. So often, cancer patients take extra precautions. That's why our cancer patients haven't died in many numbers, because they usually take their own safety and they stay at one room in a house or socially they distance from others. They also know, and they wear the mask and they use sanitizers and, and uh, our Sri Lanka has high literacy rate also. So people all know uh, this information. And, taking all precautions of uh, hospital staff also take a lot of precautions so that the cross infections are also less. So again, many steps were taken by the Sri Lanka College of Oncologists as well as the government. So Sri Lanka College of Oncologists has issued a notice uh, on the form of guidelines to cancer patients. I will tell it later. Ministry of Health has given guidance to all the patients in this country and like uh, setting up temperature measurements in the entrance by security forces or hand washing area or set up and triad areas with the declaration. So these are in the early stages, respiratory rewards were set up in each hospital and designated uh, uh, some COVID hospitals were uh, made in various places in the uh, high intensity places and quarantine centers as well. And provision of uh, personal protective equipments, uh, plenty of personal protective equipments given face masks, face shield, gloves, full PPE, and testing for COVID like uh, the rapid antigen test, PCR testing done. So this is the notice given by the uh, Sri Lanka College of Oncologists that uh, addresses four main things, um, points. That is, first one is patients who have completed active treatment, they asked to, that uh, we asked to refrain from coming to clinics for routine checkups, routine investigations like ultrasound, CT scan, until we tell to them. And also, Patients who have completed cytotoxic therapy and they are on uh, oral medications like tamoxifen for uh, breast cancer and um, thyroxine for thyroid cancer, like other oral tablets or like example, sunogenic for renal cancer like that, they can send their representatives or relatives to get that. Because otherwise they have to come out all the way and expose here. So to avoid that. And patients who are on active treatment, we ask them to come like active treatment, like surgery or radiotherapy or chemotherapy, they have to come because they have to manage the disease. Otherwise, they will go, they will die of the cancer. 
So, and fourth one, if you have any respiratory symptoms like COVID symptoms, we ask them to go to nearby hospitals to rule out COVID and go to that particular hospitals. This is in the single and Tamil format to uh, see uh, to be seen by these patients. And again, many steps were taken in the hospital itself. In the radiotherapy department, we have offered radiotherapy to disease management point of view. It's a definitive treatment. If you are giving for head and neck cancer, we usually start treating them. And the urgent cases like oncological emergencies, like spinal cord compression, brain metastasis, all we treat that. And also we have employed hypofractionated regions. For example, breast cancer, we earlier treated 50 gray in 25 days of treatment. Nowadays, it's changed to 40 gray in 15 fractions. And recently, in UK and other countries, they have changed to uh, fast forward trials like 26 gray in five fractions. We also used here for right side breast cancer because left side, the heart beneath the chest wall, it's a bit difficult. So then we are using for the right side at the moment. And also, we have instructed the patients and the staff how to uh, minimize the COVID infections. Uh, to the patients and also treatment interruptions if it happens we have adjusted that and added some more fractions according to the radiobiological principles and the surgery point of view uh, they have screening started screening the sense screening for covid so they i, mean, I have to mention here dr kanishkati silva uh, here, the one surgeon he has made uh, he, uh, some uh, plans so that uh, the patients will do the pcr in the opd basis and go home when it is positive, we will inform them and they will in turn contact the area uh, PHI and go to the centers or other hospital, COVID hospitals. If negative, they will come to uh, the hospital for surgery. So this is a good way of uh, reducing the COVID positive cases getting into our system. Other one is identified cases like uh, respiratory disorders. If it's identified, we put to respiratory ward in those days, early days, we kept for some time and we sent them to COVID uh, hospitals uh, immediately. Uh, then, despite these advices given by the oncology community, some patients defaulted treatment. They defaulted surgery, they defaulted definitive radiotherapy, they defaulted definitive chemotherapy. Maybe possibly access to hospital may be an issue. Uh, those days, the public transport was not there and prioritizing some other issues, financial issues and so on, and fear of COVID and so on. So they may not come, they wouldn't have come. So then curative treatment definitely, if not performed and not accepted uh, or not uh, uh, received, they will lose the opportunity of cure. Because in the early stage, you can cure them and their survival will drop and their quality of life also will go down. So risk level among completed treatment also up to two years after treatment, you have to be careful. Then, uh, so we, in the, like in other hospitals, in the Maharagama Cancer Hospital also, we have made a COVID-19 action committee. The director is the chair of the committee. And uh, I actually, I have I've been doing the coordinator work. And then there are other consultants, consultant microbiologists and virologists. They are the very important people. Dr. Saman Mali is always uh, very busy with this uh, management program here. And the uh, consultant physicians, the, the, the Dr. Damodaran, uh, they all are, doing throughout 24 hours they are working because a lot of work is there three wards are there for them to look after and the doctor can't even and other one is um, other consultant clinical oncologists are also there Dr. Mangauri and others uh, and consultant pediatric oncologist from Sanjeev all in the team and on course surgeon Dr. Kanishka Silva I really also mentioned and uh, anesthetist uh, and uh, chemical pathologist and radiologist all are in this team plus PG trainees as a representative and medical officer the ETU because ETU medical officer is the first point of contact and bed management team to make it the bed and medical officer from GMOA branch representative because we have to make a roster for among the medical officers matron because we have to allocate nurses PHIs they are the one important Coordinating the centers outside isolation ward, nursing officer. They are doing throughout the work, they are tirelessly, they are doing a lot of work in our in isolation ward. Nursing officer in the clinics, uh, doctor clinic arrangements, and day chemo unit arrangement, physicist in the radiotherapy department. Uh, so, radiotherapist and other sound demand also. We invite people for this uh, committee meeting so that we have a meeting with the, uh, all the input we take in and we 
used to take a good decision so that everybody will uh, abide by this decision taken by the action committee. Uh, this is the first ever uh, we have put a plan in the early days, early days trials and when the trial is suspected case we send to ward 21 the isolation ward and then from there PCR done if negative we admitted the patient guided biopsies high school admissions surgical care and other head and neck cancers or radiotherapy all this we did PCR testing so like that we have been doing in those early days like this sort of arrangement later with the availability of uh, rapid antigen test plainly available so we have changed this setup like this we have for the medical oncology patients we have done rat antigen test and if negative only we have admitted those who are positive we have put to the ward 21 ward 18 and 19 also we have opened it because we now wanted because we thought this is not a problem going to finish soon so we have to treat the positive cases also uh, oncological wise also we have to treat otherwise patients may die of cancer while they are having positive of for this covid so now we have three wards and we are keeping many patients here and we are sharing the uh, shared care plan is happening with the vps so and bed management team will try to send uh, the low risk patients those who are not needed need of uh, oncology care are being sent out so that our wards three wards will be free to accommodate or cater for the patients who need oncology treatment also and surgical side also they are helping a lot in the emergencies even if positive cases they take and with the full pb they are helping us by doing surgeries so also this committee advised a lot of WhatsApp groups among medical officers, registrars, and consultants, nurse nurses like that. And plus we as College of Oncologists have given phone hotline uh, telephones to have telemedicine so that people can contact, it's published, so people will contact and they will send their addresses to collect the oral medications by post and email and Zoom meetings for CME, CPD, and the other thing is the post, Sri Lanka Postal Department also helping us to send the medicine by post. Again, advice for actions by the COVID committees, uh, we actually convince the patient by telephone conversation. Earlier, as I said, SLCO provided free telephone hotline services for us to use that. Visitors, we have limited, sometimes no visitors if they are okay. If they are very feeble, sometimes we limit a visitor like that. And patients waiting area, uh, seat, that seats are arranged in back-to-back -back manner, spaced out manner, not to have breathing um, their, their, their contacts and clinic visits, medications for longer duration we are, we are giving for oral cancer, um, the oral treatment like uh, tamoxifen for three months, aromatex for three months, uh, this uh, thyroxine for three months like that. And also we are posting that. And also these, uh, those who are coming for the oral medication, we quickly see and reduce the crowd staying for longer time. And masks we are providing sometimes, those who are not having proper masks and that no entertainment is allowed. Earlier days, the people come and have some music with our patients and entertain them. Now we have banned those things and no direct donations. Earlier they come and directly give goods to the patients uh, quite often, but now it is stopped, but they are be diverted to the central donation unit in the director's office and stop the staff patients eating together. They all found earlier they used to do this one, now it's called banned. And canteen setup have been changed and healthcare workers are vaccinated early. We have tried to get the early vaccination in our hospital so that uh, they will be uh, healthy and they will do the good work. And so to see the assess the uh, uh, things what has happened in a hospital due to this COVID. The impact assessment, we wanted to do it. So we have analyzed some uh, data, that secondary data analysis from the statistics department. We are very kind of the statistics unit in medical officer who has given all the information to us. So number of new patients, we have analyzed uh, clinic visits, admissions, OPD blood transfusions, endoscopy, CT imaging, radiotherapy in LENAC, cobalt, brachytherapy, therapy, radiation, and radioactive iodine and OPD chemos and surgeries we have analyzed. So before seeing these results by a graph, line graph, you have to remember that in 2020, in April and November, government has imposed many times this curfew or lockdown and so on. So this will be reflected in this analysis as well. So this one, you see the new registration in 1990 and 
2019 and 2020, you can see in April and November, they said less, less number of patients registered. And the same thing in clinic visits also, April and November, very less in 2020. And ward admissions, the same thing, April and November, very less. Day chemotherapy, a little bit, uh, not much different, but still they say the uh, difference is there. And Linac treatment, this is, there's not much difference. Here you can see that 2019 and 2020, sometimes more than 2019, because before COVID crisis even, COVID situation even, we have been calling the patients on appointment basis. We call them by phone and fix the time, and we have a waiting list of two months. So then this has not affected because we have been doing that. And it's very expensive also to have it outside. So the patients will definitely come. They won't spend nine lakhs or 10, 1 million. So they will come to our hospital. So it is reflected very well. So there's uh, no difference at all. So this one, some differences there. CT simulation, you know, for the LANAC planning, CT simulation is important. But here, the April, it has come down because the new cases are less now. So cases, the patients came, the new patients are less in numbers. So we have also less number only referred to CT simulation work. So that is reflected here. Then COBOR treatment, they say drop in April because COBOR usually is an old technology treatment. So here we are reporting only the palliative cases. So those who are not in symptoms, so we may give nowadays morphine and so on during this crisis time, rather than they come here and so on. So that is dropped a lot in April. Brachytherapy also the same thing, procedure based. So you need to indicate and find it. So it's less in April. A radioactive iodine therapy. Here, earlier drops only you have seen, but in this graph you have seen, you are seeing April, May, June, zero cases. You may wonder why it is zero because the radioactive iodine we are getting from abroad. So those days, no flights. So it affected a worldwide pandemic. So then we couldn't get this radioactive iodine. So it catched up on the August, September, October months. Yes, very well reflected. Then surgery is here. This is a very important graph because these graphs are well separated apart because the surgery have dropped a lot because they have done they have used aerosolgenerative procedures. So they are very strict for only they are doing the PCR and everything. So there are some delays and uh, they are selecting also. Because and other thing is in worldwide, they are advising to have new adjoint chemos instead of uh, uh, straight away going for surgery because you have to keep the uh, ventilators and ICUs for the COVID care. So similar sort of thing is happening here also. Very highly significant reduction. Blood transfusion, the OPD, that also again April and May, it, no, it has reduced. Endoscopies, aerosol generating procedures, unnecessarily they are not doing endoscopies unless it's needed or to put some stent for the purpose of this. That, that was a, a very uh, much reduced in April and November. This one is very interesting because CT scanning earlier in April, it has reduced. Now it is picking up because the problem is now for COVID patients also, they are doing CTs and we are having the COVID patients in our hospitals also. And the PET CT scan, it's done. PET is done once in a month or one, two times per month. So the balance days, the CT is used for CT scanning. So the CT scan number is quickly rising. That's why this graph has changed like this. So this just republished this data in the last annual uh, scientific uh, sessions of SLCO. Uh, this is another uh, presentation about COVID testing. We are doing rapid antigen test and also the PCR. So these are the positives. So if you see the rapid antigen tests, they are in this year from January to July, uh, 153 positives for the PCR. It is 253 like that. So this, this is the pattern. So you may see January and May, there are more positive cases. Do not so coming up, but January and May are the one more positive cases we have found. So this again, the isolation unit are about 21. This is again, I have put a graph here, solid malignancy versus hematological malignancy. You can see because um, yeah, when you see the April one, almost solid and hematological malignancy is the same number admitted. 
that means uh, it is that hematological malignancies one thing is uh, they are getting more in fact immunity is less and other thing is they are getting the treatment also regularly so they may get the uh, low immunity due to treatment as well so but january they have admitted many number but you may see that earlier graph the positives january high may also high you know but why didn't you have have the more number in may in the admission to our hospital because our hospital when we admit into our isolation ward those patients are getting this antibody a response very long after so they stay for a long time till they discharge so their discharge is a bit late so there is no bed to accommodate that's why this may may among the identified patients have been transferred to some other hospitals that's why this uh, issue of uh, not showing in the may peak of test positive is not shown in the admissions new admission in the ward 21 isolated ward so we are going to analyze that also later why this response is less and so on and the professor Surangit will tell about when they are talking about vaccines so this is again uh, this vaccines also the sri lanka college of oncologists have uh, issued some guidelines for vaccination there are four main things they have mentioned is that is patients who have completed treatment and are on surveillance uh, can be part of the general public. They can get it in the uh, outside also, the vaccination, but still prioritizing is good within two years after treatment. Then second one, patients with solid tumors who are on no about to commence chemotherapy can obtain the vaccine uh, once they have recovered from the effects of chemotherapy, but the individual treating consultant has to decide on timing because sometimes if it is they're very neutropenic and so on, sometimes they may not get the immune response. So we may have to adjust that uh, timing. Sometimes just before starting the second uh, cycle, you may give the vaccine or uh, after uh, 10 days or something. That depends on the consultant's decision. Then third one, for the hematological malignancy, the consultant concerned has to uh, ideally case by case has to decide because their immunity also less and so on. So they may be the better people to decide for that. And fourth one is pediatric uh, cases. There's an issue of parent vaccination also important, but children at the moment, no one is getting vaccinated below uh, 30 years here. So the parents are being vaccinated uh, to avoid this because they are close in contact. This again for the vaccination protocol, uh, we are advising the cancer patients uh, how to get the vaccines everywhere it is being displaced, uh, display in the display. So again, um, the, the College of Hong Kong is here, Dr. Helmi and Dr. Sajini have written to uh, Sudat Samravira, he is no more there at the moment, but still they are following up, as we told next week, or, like we may get vaccines for our patients who are on treatment. This is again, chemo-oncological services are functioning very well. All the chemotherapy they are continuing. Planned autologous bone marrow transplants are carried out without any stopping because they are continuing it during even the crisis time with trying circumstances. Even when the COVID infection is uh, the appropriate treatment are offered. Vaccination advice are being given case by case. This is a very good thing of pie chart. If you see the incidence in the cancer registry, the hematological cases are nearly 6.8 percentage, but in the COVID positivities are very high, nearly 20 percent among the COVID positive cases in our setup. That means there's obvious that uh, the hematology patients are uh, more prone to get uh, infection because immunity is less among them. And pediatric oncology, here there are double problem because they have to look after children as well as parents for COVID infection. So when the COVID positive, they manage to transfer the patients to IDH and Omagama. When transferring a child from other hospitals, also our pediatric oncologists are requesting PCR test negativity. If negativity only, they will accept, otherwise they can't transfer here. And COVID testing before admission and OPD procedures have been done and continuing maintenance for ALS, even with the COVID positivity. Other care provisions in our National Cancer Institute, like mental well-being, mindfulness, relaxation, exercise, breathing, and temporarily halted. Our psychiatrist, uh, uh, Dr. Pushpa Kumara, uh, he's uh, doing a uh, good telecare during that uh, 
time also he had this now also he is doing a lot of uh, um, work for the covid positive patients in the isolation ward with our bps and palliative care uh, medications for longer period they are giving the palliative care unit and nutrition clinical nutritionist is working in the wards and physiotherapy and so on a bit less so this is the way our cancer patients care have been affected and this is the impact we have evidenced during this two year one and a half year period uh, thank you thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr jayakumar that was a very uh, comprehensive analysis and an overview of uh, the cancer care uh, during the challenging times so next up on screen is dr vimuktini peeris uh, a consultant a clinical oncologist at the district general hospital kolon narva um vimuktini was completing her uh, overseas training in clinical oncology in the uk uh, during the last year when the pandemic was at its height um so having experienced uh, the challenges of and responses to the pandemic in both countries she will be talking to you about the lessons learned from the rest of the world um on cancer care during the pandemic uh, over to you vimuktini um good afternoon uh, thank you dr somwadana for that kind introduction um you can see my screen uh, so i'm going to talk about uh, covid-19 in cancer patients and lessons learned across from the world um as you have already witnessed there have been massive di disruptions to healthcare systems both uh, not only in the low resource settings but also in the high resource settings across the world as well and um, as dr jaykumar said uh, cancer patients or uh, we have we know that cancer patients have an increase from covid-19 but uh, not only that but due to decreased screening and also decreased healthcare seeking practices and also due to delays in healthcare provision uh, mortality from cancer itself is uh, expected to rise and so covid-19 even after cessation of the pandemic we will see its impact uh, to, from two years to come so the pandemic has challenged the standard approach to cancer care um, so lessons learned from the world so the reflection on these lessons both positive and negative is vital so um these um uh, this from the asco global webinars uh, the recommendations and lessons learned from uh, different presentations uh, done from presenters across the world so these are simple measures that we have already adopted uh, so patients with active cancer should self isolate uh, for example in the nhs uh, they have sent out a letter to all their cancer patients saying that the government advises that you should self isolate for 90 days which is an extremely effective measure and also screening patients before a facility visit uh, to avoid unnecessary hospital and outpatient visits uh, and also what we have already adopted in our setting shipping oral drugs to patients so are extremely uh, important and simple measures the, to reduce a uh, contact and also risk minimizing approaches what can we do in our setting uh, reflecting from the world uh, avoid treatment with high complication rates uh, uh, which can be done without compromise in outcome and provide adequate supportive care so for example use less toxic regimes with equivalent efficacy where appropriate for example cisplatin instead of cisplatin carboplatin and also use of hematopoietic growth factors and aggressive use of antiemetics are helpful towards uh, lessening hospital admissions and complications and also um, reduce uh, in facility treatment sessions by using uh, oral agents instead of parenteral and also like in the nhs has adopted subcutaneous herceptin instead of parenteral so decrease in the infusion time um, and also switch into schedules with long intervals for example across the immunotherapy where it's given um, the six week schedule was adopted instead of the three week regime so and also treatment holidays when indicated um, the examples quoted were optimox like uh, giving um, high intensity chemotherapy um, for a short period and then putting the patient on oral chemotherapy uh, maintenance regime so that the patient's uh, hospital visits are minimized 
And uh, Dr. Jai Kumar always stressed on the hyperfractionation regime. So, uh, and he mentioned the fast forward trial. So the fast forward trial was actually adopted by the RCR uh, even before the fast forward trial was officially published, uh, shifting to five fractions in the 15 fractions for breast, whole breast artery, uh, which has been widely practiced across the NHS, which is um, highly uh, useful and also it is very uh, effective in the COVID-19 times. Um, and so prioritization of patient care, so it is, it is an um, important issue. So with the safety concerns of COVID, uh, which patients to treat and which patients should we leave alone? So uh, the ESMO recommendations are very helpful towards identifying these patients. So the tier one, the high risk patients, uh, are the ones that um, whose patients' conditions are already life threatening because of the cancer, or we have an intervention which will provide significant overall survival or quality of life gain. For example, treating patients with small cell lung cancer or uh, treating patients with hematological oncological malignancies. So uh, those are tier one prioritization. And um, tier two uh, of other patients like uh, the moderate gain and delay beyond six weeks could potentially impact outcome. So adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer or colon cancer falls into tier two. And the other patients who are on palliative treatment where we don't have a intervention with a big survival or quality of life gain. So these patients are actually in a low risk setting and we had to think whether we, do we need to get these patients into the hospital for treatment where the risk is more and a minimal benefit. So I'm going to talk about telemedicine a little bit here. Uh, doctor, I know that Dr. Jai Kumaran did talk about telemedicine. So uh, the pandemic actually has resulted in the rapid expansion of telemedicine consultation worldwide. So, uh, why we have done that is because uh, it, we can continue care for our oncological patients while maintaining social distancing. So uh, not only to provide urgent care for surveillance, for new patient consultations, for follow-up consultations, um, uh, for clinical trials, consent, enrollment, and also for provision of palliative care, telemedicine has been utilized worldwide. Uh, so not only does it reduce the burden of uh, healthcare staff, it also decreases the need for PPE among the other benefits. So um, it's a change that is likely to end, end your post pandemic. So um, let us go into more detail on that. So we might think that what can we do with telemedicine? Is it really effective? Can a simple phone call, can, can it achieve anything? So the results, uh, the data shows that it is indeed safe and effective. Uh, patients did not feel that it compromised medical care or the patient-physician relationship. So the overwhelming majority uh, said that their concerns were met and 85% wished to continue telemedicine services. So the, these re results that I have quoted are from a trial done in Israel, but there are similar trials done in the UK as well as China, which show similar results. Um, so which patients are suitable for telemedicine? So uh, again, the ESMO has come up with some uh, recommendations. Uh, so the patients on oral therapy for consultation and prescription renewal, uh, and also toxicity evaluation, dose adaptation, and supportive care can be provided over the phone. And also the patients who are in tier three, the stable patients or the non-critical patients who can be delayed. So they can be uh, followed up over the phone. And also the patients on surveillance who are not on active treatment uh, can be given a call uh, to check up on how they are doing. So um, telemedicine, uh, so apart from calling the patient from our oncological centers, I think, it can also provide a link between uh, our outreach clinics and the oncology centers, as well as the provincial oncology centers uh, with the tertiary care centers. So um, I think we have practically, we have seen that our patients for ID registration for PET scans, they have to travel across provinces. So I think that using uh, telemedicine, we can like minimize these across provincial visits travel as well. 
Uh, of course, there are some setbacks to telemedicine. We need appropriate infrastructure, reliable internet, as well as a phone connection, functioning electronic devices, and also platform literacy. And uh, providers have to be trained, and there are some privacy issues, as well as documentation and record keeping issues. Uh, however, I would like to stress that um, in a low resource setting like ours, I think medicine is actually the way forward because uh, we have already seen that our patients have a big burden traveling to and fro from oncology centers. So uh, by a simple phone call, we can do a lot for them and also uh, prevent exposure for, for them to COVID. And also our healthcare system is vulnerable. So uh, maintaining social distancing and minimizing risk and contact is really crucial. So I think telemedicine is the way forward and the worldwide telemedicine has been adopted in oncological practice. So I think it's high time that we look it, uh, look up, look it up and adopt it uh, more in our practice as, as uh, it is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vimuktin. Um, that was a very comprehensive one. Um, the next speaker doesn't need uh, any introduction uh, to the, the, the Sri Lankan Medical Fraternity Doesn't in Clinical Immunology and Allergy at the Institute of Immunity and the Transplantation of the Royal Free Hospital London and University College London and the Health Services Laboratories in London. Um, he's an international expert um, in, in immunology, autoimmune, allergy, mast cell disorders, and immunogenetics. And he's the best person to talk about uh, COVID vaccination for cancer patients. So, Professor Suranjit Senemiratna, uh, ladies and gentlemen, over to you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, thank, thank you, Buddhika. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you to uh, uh, to uh, Sachini Hilmi. Uh, for the invitation and thanks to Dr. Jayakumaran and Dr. Vimuktani. So what I'll do now is give you a quick overview of uh, COVID-19 vaccines for, for cancer patients. As it stands today, you know that information is moving very rapidly, information flow and new information is done. So if I give you a take-home message, sort of a summary at the, at the start, and then I'll build my case to, on this summary, COVID-19 in cancer, significant issues. Mortality is high, morbidity is high, more for blood cancers than for solid cancers. How can we prevent that? Vaccines are coming in. However, we may need some of the vaccines are not as effective as in a healthy person. We may need a shorter gap not, rather than the 12-week gap that is being used in countries like uh, 10 to 12 week in, UA, in the UK. We may need bo uh, booster doses and non-pharmacological methods should also be continued despite the people getting the vaccines. So that is a nutshell, the summary in a nutshell with regards to this talk. And then I will expand uh, it in two, three areas, the basic information, just touch on cancer and COVID, just to lay the background and then talk on cancer and COVID vaccines and with one or two slides on CLL and multiple myeloma. Now, this is a moving field. What we tell, what I say today would de definitely develop in the next three months or so. And uh, this is the current information as at the present time. All of us know about the uh, virus, the spike protein binds to the ACE receptor, enters the cell, multiplies in the cell and spreads from cell to cell and also from person to person. Why did I put this slide? The spike protein, that is the one that is being targeted by the vaccines. So when you, uh, when people have uh, serology antibody tests, we have to know what test we are measuring because if you, if you uh, find that your measuring the nucleocapsid, which is a protein in the, in the middle of the virus, then you might find a negative test when actually you had to measure spike protein uh, antibody tests. Now, antibody tests, very important message here is we do not as yet have a robust surrogate marker, immune surrogate marker for protection. So just doing 
random antibody tests after vaccination does not play a role. It will come up, we'll get levels, but not at the present moment. And that is an important take home message. COVID, all of us have been in this uh, pandemic since last year. Millions of people, close, 4 million deaths have occurred. The number of million, 185 million cases in the world. And you can see it has affected all countries, some more than others. The US is the most, India, there was a massive pandemic. And this is the value that I got for Sri Lanka. And the UK, again, it has affected, uh, we have been affected quite badly in the last 18 months or so. So quickly, just building up uh, to the uh, talk, we know that there is the immune system that fights against viruses, bacteria, fungi, you have the innate immune system, you have the adaptive immune system, it's the defense system of the country. You have antibodies, you have white cells, mainly lymphocytes is the main thing, but other white cells also. So antibodies and lymphocytes, when you get an infection, people produce antibodies, people produce specific lymphocytes against that part. What we are trying to do is, we are trying to give vaccines to get this before the person gets the infection and potentially dies of the infection or gets into hospital. We must remember that the immune cells talk to each other using cytokines. A certain amount of cytokine is important, but if the cytokines are very high, then you get hypercytokinemia and then you get leakage of fluid, etc. And that is the uh, process that we try to block when the people get into hospital and into ITU. So that those are some basic aspects of the immune system. Remember that there is innate and adaptive, and the virus is very, very good at circumventing or trying to evade the innate immune system. They, it can do it. And in cancer patients, the innate immune system, again, because of the disease, and because of the treatment can be affected. And so you can imagine the risk they are put in a cancer patient when they see the SARS-CoV-2 virus and which causes COVID-19. So if you look at the pathology, a number of cells increase, neutrophils, some cells decrease further, lymphocytes, some chemicals increase, cytokines, cytokine storm, etc. And this is very well characterized in patients who get severe COVID. You have asymptomatic, you have mild, you have moderate, you have severe. The people severe is the group that we concentrate, especially with the vaccines, except because they get into hospital and they, they are the ones who the mortality levels are high. We have the standard immune response. We have antibodies forming, IgG, IgA, IgM antibodies, and we have those increasing and then it reduces. And we want memory responses. That is some response like, like us having individual memory, we have immune memory so that the B cells can respond very fast. And then you have other cell, cell types, that is, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, and B cells. So all these get together and protect the patient from getting severely ill. Now, as I told you, there are different types of cells, CD4, CD8 cells. They are directed against different parts of the virus. And that is why the next phase of vaccines that we'll get, the phase two, phase three, would be vaccines that are targeting different parts of the virus, because at the moment, the vaccines are targeting spike, but they are very good vaccines so that we have got so far. So eight vaccines or around that have been approved, but we must remember that four were abandoned. So not every vaccine that was developed has been a success. Some have not uh, been successful, and they had to just be uh, dumped in the bin while we have some good vaccines at the present moment and several are in progress. So this is a summary of the different vaccine. And you all know about the mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, then you have the viral vector vaccines, the AstraZeneca, Sinopharm, uh, JNJ, and Sino, and then you have the Sinopharm and the Sinovac vaccine, which are inactivated vaccines. And we all know that the mRNA vaccines, the best vaccines around. I and mean, that is very well knowledge, uh, good knowledge. And the inactivated vaccines, that is the Sinopharm and the Sinovac, and the immune response definitely is not as good as the mRNA, and they may need uh, several boosts, uh, as we see in different countries. So these are the vaccines. Most of them are two doses. The efficacy is given uh, in a clinical trial, and then the costs are given there. And I will come to that again. Many countries have vaccinated at speed, and you can see that certain 
a number of countries have gone over 50 percent of a given of people getting the first dose that is adults getting the first dose and you can see the countries and but the important message from there is still the world is only 20 percent uh the world has only 20 percent of people in the world overall have received the first dose and that is still too low so that was some basic information and then i'll just quickly run through some information about cancer and covid which will lay the background for cancer and covid vaccines now we know that both cancer and covid have common predisposing factors that is age obesity of uh, the metabolic comorbidities etc will increase the chance cancer patients will have those and that will increase the chance of getting severe covid in addition cancer patients have immune deficiency per se and the treatment they get would also cause some immune uh, dysfunction and that too can lead to severe covid and if you look at this slide what are we trying to do we are trying to bring the person when they get covid infection to the lower left hand corner that is a good immune response t cell b cells etc we don't want them to go to the right upper corner where they develop cytokine storms and then they leak fluid and they have problems in their lungs and other organs and you can see from this this figure what it shows is in the healthy people a lot of people go down into the good immune response while in cancer it's just the reverse where a lot of people may go in the other uh, other process and develop complications and death and this was shown in a meta analysis that was published in august last year so it's a fairly old meta 33% risk of death and that is important pediatric patients were less patients greater than 60 were had a higher risk of significant higher risk of death so that's a big big risk of death of cancer patients i'm dividing cancer patient and then you and for easiness i'm taking blood cancers and or hematologic cancers or and solid organ cancer so i will describe that again there's a big risk of patients with cancer have getting covid lots of studies i won't go into detail because this is not my remit of this talk lots of studies have been published after they got cancer mortal cancer morbidity across the world and these are just a, a snapshot of study and even the important thing that is increased risk of mortality. Even with autologous and stem cell transplant, you can find that there was, if they develop COVID, it's a poor overall survival. And you can see the survival curve that were uh, uh, produced from the, the different studies, uh, a combination of the different studies. And that is an important thing for us to also consider. Next, we I will talk that for the clinical studies. Now we'll look at the antibody responses of with COVID, not vaccination, with COVID. And this has been clearly shown, a beautiful study, which showed the patterns of uh, seroconversion. There was a high rate of seroconversion, but it was generally high rate, but it was lower in patients with, this is post-COVID, with blood cancer, proximal anti-CD20 treatment or stem cell uh, stem cell uh, transplant and so that is there is a differential rate of seroconversion to the specific patient group that is to be important thing to remember when it look at antibody level there is differential the hematology patients tend to do worse compared to the solid organ cancer patients this is again showing the mortality in the hemato-oncology patients are worse than patients with uh, solid organs this is clearly antibody levels as a as a whole in the cancer group is less than patients with uh, with uh, the healthy control and this is predominantly in the oncology in the hematon patients rather than the solid organ patients so that is a very important thing to remember but what important thing that was detected was people who had high CD8 cells, that is an important immune cell, CD8 cell, tend to do better. And that is why the vaccines are targeted. If we can get a vaccine producing good CD8 responses, because antibodies may not be working properly, if you can get good CD8 responses, that may work. So that is the important, the take-home message is, from these slides is, that the cancer patient mortality is high. Clinical studies have shown that antibody responses has a differential effect depending on the state in which they are and the important thing is certain vaccines and certain patients with better cd8 responses may be better targeted for these different patients so that was a quick run through cancer and covid to tell you what a devastating condition that can be how can we prevent it and what can we do it and this is these studies i will 
I'd speak about uh, with regards to the world literature as at the present moment. So again, these are the vaccines, about eight vaccines have been approved, some are better than the others. And the UK government from December laid down or laid out eight, nine groups, priority group, as to how they would vaccinate the population. These were the different priority groups, and all these have been completed now. And this was, if you look at this priority group uh, listing, you'll see in listing uh, uh, priority group four was clinically extremely vulnerable people. So initially, healthcare workers over 80, et cetera, were were vaccinated, but clinically extremely vulnerable people was where the cancer, especially the cancer patient group came in. And if you look at this, this is the patients who were clinically extremely vulnerable. I don't want you to read this whole slide, but I just want to focus on, you can see in the green slot, a lot of those patients were patients with cancers, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, stem cell uh, uh, therapy, et cetera, targeted therapy. And that is the group that we were focusing on people in the, uh, the epidemiology sector in the UK were focusing and clinicians were involved in safeguarding this group as Dr. Vibhuktine also mentioned in her slide. So are you extremely vulnerable population group four? If you are, get the vaccination early because delaying vaccination could be put at risk, the vaccine response I'll talk to you. And the important thing is very early, the COVID vaccine was given to people over 70 and the clinically vulnerable. There were messages there. By February, we start in December, by February, 94% of clinically vulnerable people had reported receiving at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. So that is why that group was really targeted like the older population. Now, let us look at the studies. I'll talk about five studies quickly. I won't go into great detail, but I want to know, uh, you will want to ask, what about vaccination in this group of patients? So the very, very top class study was the early study was the SOAP2 study, which looked at the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine. Now, the Pfizer vaccine was one that was rolled out initially, so more studies about that, and especially when the US and uh, uh, from Israel and most of these studies, uh, not most, some of these studies from, from US and Israel. So they, uh, they looked at cancer patients, small numbers, but this was the study that was produced. And three weeks after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, 94% of healthy individuals had a zero conversion. However, you can see this. This is a very important take home essay. 38% of solid cancer patients see the small number of hematology or malignancy. People with respiratory or skin cancers and vaccine within 15 days of chemotherapy are the ones who didn't make a good response. And a single dose was not effective against the alpha variant that was circulating there. Now we have the delta variant now, but alpha variant was circulating when this uh, uh, study was done and this was from the UK. Following the second vaccination, 95% of solid cancer patients showed a response. That was an import. There was an increase in title. There was increased neutralization. So the important message from this study was vulnerable people, patients with cancer, don't keep for 12 weeks, give the vaccine after three weeks, because by delaying the vaccine the dose to 12 weeks, the, you're not going to, especially this group, it is not a good idea, and then boosters may be needed. So that was the take-home message. And high priority groups include cancer patients and the people who are in close contact. That is, again, an important message to be remembered in addition to the cancer patient. So that was the SOAP2 study from the UK. Then we had a study very recently from Texas, which showed, looked at, again, the immunogenesis of the SARS, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the Pfizer, the two vaccines, the mRNA vaccine, and the zero conversion rate with one vaccine was low. At, well, it was 81%, but look at the title. It's very low. It was quite low. Uh, it was only 32 units, but complete vaccination, it increased, and the titers also increased. The group that was, again, not doing well, low evidence, the hemat uh, hematologic malignancy, cytoxic chemotherapy, and monoclonal antibodies. And that, that is the group for us to focus on. And remember that no patients with rituximab in this study developed antibodies even after full vaccination. That is another group for us to focus on. The responses between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine was equal. And so again, this was a very important study from Texas that came out recently. Then we had the Lithuanian study. It was a bigger study, 890, uh, 600, uh, 860 patients. The important message from that was, they looked at again, a whole range of cancer patients, blunted response, 
to antibody responses. Most neg negatively impacted were those received the BT, the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, and the uh, anti CD20 antibodies. Breakthrough infections with severe COVID was occurring, in, especially in the hematologic malignancy patient, and the imports of strict adherence to non pharmacological methods and household vaccination was stressed in this study. So, this was the Lithuanian study. So, we had the UK study, the, the Texas study, and the Lithuanian study. And finally, you had the Israel study, which came up again. It showed that patients receiving active systemic. Uh, uh, therapy, they made the zero converter, but the big issue was that the titers were low. And if you look at this figure, the figure on the first figure, the first graph showed in healthy against uh, pa uh, cancer patients, patients were lower. And in the second and third graph shows in, in the cancer patients, all the dots are towards the bottom at the end of the, uh, near the near the axis, while in cancer patients, it's, it has risen and it's higher. So this was a, again a study that showed that the titers can be low. And this is clearly shown in this figure. The titers are shown here. When it's about 7,000, it's about 1,000 odd in the patients with uh, uh, with the uh, cancers, and this has been classified according to the different types of cancers, etc. I won't go into detail because of time constraint. So the take-home message from there is vaccination is indicated to try and prevent the uh, problems occurring in the patient. However, the responses can be blunted, especially in certain groups, and therefore, we may need to, to, to shorten the time period and secondly, to give booster doses to, to get the response and target specific vaccines against specific groups of people. So next, I will quickly run through CLA because you all were interested, Budhika, et cetera, will be quite interested in the studies from, from CLA. So this was a study uh, that was... Uh, uh, came out, I think, from Israel, yes, from Israel. They looked at the CLA population. You can immediately look at the curve. You can look at the healthy population and the CLA patient. The healthy population, the red bars go across the range. They make a good response. There was a line. A lot of people made good response. But when it's CLA, you can see a big gap towards the left-hand side of that curve. There's a big gap. So a lot of CLA patients did not make pro proper response, a markedly impaired response. The lower bar shows the in red the CLL and healthy control in blue. And that was independent predictors of a better response for the younger the patient, female sex, lack of currently active treatment if the IgG and IgM levels were high. So again, in CLL population, especially group to focus on and study them and monitor them carefully because markedly impaired responses with the vaccinations at the present moment. These were the responses, 79% in people who had completed uh, their care were in remission, treatment naive patient 55, but patients on active treatment, it was only 16%. So that is a very, very poor response at the moment. That's why better vaccines and more frequent vaccine boosters at short interval are what is being taught at the moment. Patients who are getting the BTK inhibitors or went, went to CLACs or rituximab, et cetera, had an antibody response were relatively low. So again, those drugs are, again, something that we are focusing on with regards to these patients and their vaccine responses. So what can we do? As I said before, you can give them boosters, you can give them uh, uh, vaccination at a, uh, at a more frequent interval. And these guidelines will become more clear as more studies come out. I just only took uh, some studies to illustrate here. There are more studies, but I've tried to use the studies that can illustrate this process because the vaccine response are not as great as in a healthy population as we are seeing. One study to, to again show with regards to multiple myeloma, again, which has been done, uh, 56% of patients had the response to the first vaccine shares opposed to hospital staff, which was 99%. Lower antibody levels were found with active multiple myeloma, patients with immune paralysis, and patients on any treatment at the present moment. And that is another group to be focused on because we may need to change our vaccination schedule in that group of patients. And y'all are at the cutting edge of it because y'all are seeing this patient, and that is where uh, you all uh, have to give policy guidelines, et cetera, to, to not everyone does a 
policy guideline for everyone and then it has to be changed to different different categories of patients and that is what they're learning at the moment because the first thing was to prevent death in patients overall in a global scale prevent them getting to hospital prevent them people getting very ill that has been successfully done with the current vaccine now we have to go into subgroups and that is the imports of this of this uh, considering this at the present moment so in summary what i've done so far is i have given you some basic information i've given you spoken to you some background information about cancer and covid and told you what a devastating condition that could be and the importance of preventing them getting covid and vaccination appropriate social distancing method could help in the appropriate circumstance uh, i've spoken to you about cancer and uh the covid-19 vaccine is and also as a general solid organ cancers hematological cancer i've spoken to about cln multiple myeloma the two important studies that have been illustrated there and the important take home message again it's a significant disease blood cancers are more than have a bigger problem than solid cancer as it go short cap may be needed booster dose may be needed and non pharmacological method must be continued despite the person getting vaccine because the response may not be as good as people with healthy immune systems thank you very much thank you very much uh, prof sanviratna that was very helpful um we would welcome a few questions uh, and it's time for a, a short discussion um as we have already um uh past 3 pm now right anyway uh, we would welcome a few questions um prof sarilat i have one question um so um usually um these autologous transplant patients and allogeneic transplant patients um who have completed their uh, their transplant 3 months ago so what what was what would you recommend uh, what would be the ideal time for covid vaccination is it after 3 months or 6 months usually we vaccinate them after 6 months yeah so i think with the with the new variants coming and it spreading etc around the world etc some immunity is better than no immunity we know that the problem that is happening with the immunocompromised patients is that the immune response is blunted compared to a patient who is not uh, uh, whose immune system is good so the general recommendation that following now is go for 3 months i know the oxford group goes for autologous they go for 1 month rather than they just autologous for for a, for a, for a uh, allo they go for 3 months but for autologous they bring it even further they bring it uh, down because you know some response would be because uh, is then you can build up on some response rather than you know uh, i mean if you give it in, in in a week or so after allo you're not going to have big response because you know uh, that is not going to happen so you have to give that you yeah. have to give it at the correct time so 3 months yeah okay but uh, for allo you can go for load not uh, allo sorry auto sorry auto yeah auto yeah um there are a few questions from the audience um uh, dr sachini malaviara ji um is questioning um Uh, there's a question what is the time gap you would recommend to do a covid pcr after vaccination what will be the expected outcome i assume that she meant uh, the antibody. antibody level yeah yeah after vaccination right this is a very very interesting question it's antibody i think such an investment uh, was uh, thinking about because you can't get a pcr positive after vaccination i'm unless you are in, yeah. unless you are infected with a uh, with uh, uh, by meeting the uh, virus so the, the thing is i mean when when you look at antibodies it from about 7 days 14 days it it develop normally we measure antibodies after so fully vaccinated is 14 days after the second vaccine normally we measure after about 21 days to 24 because we allow the response to go the big problem we have at the moment is that we don't have a good reliable immune marker of protection so therefore you can't get a an antibody level you can say positive or negative say if you give a vaccine to a person with a hematological malignancy and there's no response you must select the correct antibody because if it is measuring nuclear capsid or and you try to measure it after vaccination for a person who is uh, getting the vaccine it's not going to be positive because you uh, that is 
uh, you know, because the vaccine is a spike protein uh, directed vaccine. So it has to be pro proper antibody test and it would help in a situation where you give the vaccine and then you'll see whether it's positive and if it's negative, then you go for another vaccine, right? You go for another one at a shorter time period. But you can't look at a level at the present moment and say, okay, I'm just giving you a, I'm giving you a just a, a sort of figure I just picked up from so 40 units. So therefore they are protected, no, don't worry, they have no problem. You, we don't have that immune correlate. Now for hepatitis B, for et cetera, we have a, a good, a reasonable immune correlate. There are some viruses we don't have a good immune correlate. And one of these is uh, the, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but that will come up. People are getting it. And the important thing is you must know what method is because just because you're measuring antibodies, you'll be measuring a total antibody, neutralizing antibodies, uh, binding antibodies, et cetera. It may not mean nothing. You must, one neutralizing antibodies, when it finally comes as protection, it has to be in that kit because in another part of the world, that neutralizing antibody will be different. So that is the important thing of clinicians working hand in hand with people working in the lab to be able to work, iron this out and then decide as it comes into the world, what is the antibody title? It will come in and these this are developing, it will come in. So at the present moment, I would say 21 days to a month that after that, that you will measure the antibody. If, if you are measuring just to see if a positive, because then you, will, uh, then you will give another vaccine. Uh, uh, you will a positive, but don't try to read too much on the antibody levels at the present moment. That knowledge will come up. Um, thank for you, studies, Professor. it's important. For studies, yeah. I would. Uh, for studies, it's important. That's that's what they are doing now to look at it. Right. Thank you. Right. I think there are a couple of questions. I would select a few questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kirusha Navarat, as well as the Rizwan Mohiti, have asked the same question. Now, uh, in your lecture, you presented, uh, Prof, that uh, uh, you know between uh, 15 days following chemotherapy, like after 15 days following chemotherapy, the zero con conversion is blunted. Um, so usually, when we give chemotherapy, the the nadir of uh, the blood counts occur around seven to ten days in most of the, the chemotherapy uh, cycles. And uh, usually the next chemotherapy cycle is followed after three to four weeks following the first chemotherapy cycle. So uh, what would be the ideal time uh, uh, considering this 15 day of blunted zero conversion and the gap between the two chemotherapy cycles? Yes, yeah, so I think at the present moment with the knowledge that is coming up, we have to, I mean, there are two two uh, sort of conflicting things. We would love the immune system to have recovered to a wonderful, to a, to a reasonable level to give the vaccine, but we know that is not going to happen. We would, you know, you don't want to give it when the neutrophil counts are really low, you know, when the immune system has been sort of really knocked off. Uh, you wouldn't want to give it. So I would say in about two weeks after that, because otherwise I know it's 15 days planted. That's the best time because then the immune response will start rising before they get in the next game. Because this is the situation. I mean, you all do it on a day-to-day -day basis. You would love to knock off the cancer completely, but at the pro same process, you don't want to affect the patient to such a level that their immune system will will uh, sort of collapse and then they will uh, die of an infection. So that is why all that balance is why the, the, the picture will become very clear. I think these studies are showing initial results which regards to 15 days. So I would say about two weeks time, that is, that is, the, uh, that is the consideration given at the moment. Right. Um, I think um, we had a very successful and a very interesting session today. Um, I don't think we have much time for further questions. I think it would be really useful, Prof, if we can have uh, your email probably so that you yeah, can uh, sure. individually uh, be in contact by our, our uh, audience. So, um, sure, but yeah. yeah, thank you very much. And I must thank Dr. Jay Kumaran, uh, Bimuktini, and also um, Professor Senviratna for their immense help and uh, educating us, sharing their experience and knowledge with us today. Very helpful. And uh, in wrapping up, I also should thank uh, Dr. Sachini Madhaviara, she's the secretary of the SLCU, and uh, Prof. Dr. Hilmi, uh, the, the president of the SLCU, for organizing this event uh, in collaboration with SLNMA. It was very um, helpful. 
And um, the, I must also uh, mention that we, the SLCO, is always more than happy to um, take the lead in sharing the knowledge in cancer care uh, uh, with the rest of the medical fraternity in Sri Lanka. Uh, so um, thank you very much. And I should thank all the participants, all the attendees online. Thank you for joining online with us. Um, thank you very much and have a good day. Good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.